WISC TV3 Studios in Madison. The Wisconsin Broadcasters Association Foundation presents the 2022 gubernatorial debate with incumbent Democratic Governor Tony Evers and Republican challenger Tim Michaels. Here's WBA President and CEO Michelle Vetterkind. Good evening. The Wisconsin Broadcasters Association and its member radio and television stations are pleased to welcome you to this gubernatorial debate. Tonight's event originates from Madison, Wisconsin, at the studios of WISC-TV. We have a team of broadcasters from communities large and small across the state involved in bringing this debate to you. Tonight's debate continues the WBA's long-standing commitment to excellence and public service. The debate is underwritten by the WBA Foundation and supported by a grant from the Wisconsin Association of Independent Colleges and Universities and the Wisconsin Counties Association. Now, let's go to our moderator, a veteran Wisconsin broadcaster, member of the WBA Hall of Fame, and professor of leadership and media integrity at Loyola University Chicago, Jill Geisler. Good evening. On Tuesday, November 8th, Wisconsin voters will choose between two candidates for governor, incumbent Democrat Tony Evers and Republican challenger Tim Michaels. They've agreed to do just one debate before the election, and this is it. Here are the rules to which everyone has agreed. With each question from our statewide panel of journalists, candidates will be told the length of time they have for a response, either one minute or 30 seconds. Now, we all see countdown clocks. When candidates hit their time limit, I will let them know. If they continue, I will note it, and their microphone will cease to work. If candidates fail to answer a specific question or change the subject, I will exercise the moderator's option to note that and give them just 30 seconds to provide a specific answer. Now, please note, this debate provides an additional service for voters. Many complex issues require deeper context and verification, especially during debates when claims and counterclaims fly or when statistics and shorthand terms are used. And we benefit from more background. So thanks to our debate's data team, we will provide you links to additional research materials about our key topics. Just follow the link you see on the screen or follow the WBA on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter to get that additional info. Our hashtag is WBA Debate. Now, the order of response for the first and last questions was determined by coin toss. And with that, let's begin with the first question from Dan Hagen from WFJW-TV in Rhinelander. Dan. I want to ask a question about rising prices. This winter, Wisconsin families can expect to pay at least $100 more than last winter to heat their homes. At the same time, a gallon of gas costs 75 cents more than last year, and a grocery store receipt is likely around 10% higher. How would you help the people of Wisconsin who are struggling right now? Governor, you have one minute. Well, thanks so much for that great question, and thanks to the broadcasters for inviting us today and making this happen. And of course, thanks to the, uh, the voters that are watching in tonight. I have a plan around this. Obviously, inflation is something that is a worldwide phenomenon, and uh, and the and the and the impact of that inflation is also, you know, spread across the entire world. That said, I do have a plan, and I've been really hoping that the Republicans would come in a session and we could do something about it right now. But my plan is this: to mitigate against inflation. We're going to lower our, uh, our taxes on our middle class folks in the state of Wisconsin by 10%. We're going to get rid of the minimum markup law on gasoline, which could save people up to 30 cents on a gallon, and also some tax credit issues. But most importantly, the one that is most important is the one about child care, a uh, child care uh, credit. That way we're giving people the money to keep the money and we can mitigate against inflation. Thank you, Governor. Mr. Michaels, your response. Yeah, thank you for uh, hosting this tonight, WBA, and thank you for the panelists. But most importantly, thank all of you for tuning in tonight and taking part in this important political process. It's a big election coming up in a few weeks, and the future of Wisconsin is what is at stake here. We've had weak leadership under the Barnes-Evers administration, but hope is on the way. I've been a bold leader my entire life. What are some of the problems? Joe Biden, weak on inflation canceling the Keystone Pipeline, 
What can we do? We can put more money in people's pockets. I'm a businessman. I understand macroeconomics. I understand how to read a balance sheet. I'm going to do everything I can to put more money in people's pockets to help them with the price at the pump and the surging price of groceries. We're going to do massive tax reform, get more money in people's pockets here in Wisconsin and the hard-working tax-paying people of Wisconsin will spend more of that money on goods and services helping make our economy here even more robust. Thank, Thank you. you. Let's go to Michelle McCormick of WFRV TV in Green Bay. Well here's what we know about shared revenue in Wisconsin. The state when it comes to collecting taxes it goes up but when it comes to sharing that money with municipalities for critical services well it just remains stagnant. What action will you take to enable Green Bay and cities across our state to maintain and sustain public health and safety in the long term. Mr. Michaels, you have a minute. Yes, the problem across the state are widespread. They're vast. Crime is up, uh, school scores are down. I think most importantly, the best decisions, though, are made at the local level. People in county government, municipal government, village presidents, they're closest to the people. They hear the problems. We need to make sure that there is ample funds at the local level to solve the problems. The bureaucracies in Washington, D.C. are vast. The bureaucracies here in Madison need proper leadership. I'm going to make sure that we have adequate funding for the big problems. We're going to spend as much money as any governor ever has on education, but we're going to spend it wisely because right now that's not happening. And we're going to have plenty of money for law enforcement because crime is surging all through us across Wisconsin. Everywhere I go, from Superior to Kenosha, people are concerned about crime. I'm going to provide bold leadership and we're going to get crime down and we're going to make sure that law enforcement has the funds needed. Um, Mr. Michaels, just specifically shared revenue formula, what would be your vision for that? Yeah, you know, there's plenty of money in government. Uh, there's $43.5 billion spent every year. Those are the taxpayers' money. I'm going to sit down with the legislature and the smart people, my lieutenant governor, Roger Roth. We're going to make sure that we come up with the right formulas and we are going to adequate, adequately make sure that there's funding for the issues that people in Wisconsin are so concerned about. And really at the top of the list is inflation and then is crime and then it's followed by education. But I'm here to tell you, help is on the way. Governor Evers, again, the question is specifics on shared revenue and the formulas and what communities could expect. I get that. I didn't hear that from my opponent. That said, shared revenue is a big deal in the state of Wisconsin. When I, when I ran for office the first time, I made a pledge to the counties and municipalities across the state that we would increase shared revenue. Try to do it in my first budget, try to do it in my second budget. And there were reasonable th things to do, 2%, I think 4%. And the, it was it was zeroed out. If you look at the last uh, 10 years of, of of shared revenue, that's the money that comes for, got, comes into Wisconsin state government, and we send it back out to the municipalities. And less than every year, you see a zero, a zero, a zero as far as what, how much money was was uh, uh, provided to the to our municipalities. Next budget, it is my top priority. We're going to have a 4% each, each, uh, each, each year of the, of the biennium. And that helps these people do the hard work, whether it's around crime, whether it's around social services, you name it. They do the hard work. Thank you. We Your time need, is they up. Need to have the, they need to All have right, the resources. All right, we'll move on now. And the next question comes from Dr. Ken Harris from WGKB Radio and Concordia University, Milwaukee. Governor Evers, the Milwaukee Neighborhood News Service in an article this fall reported that the Milwaukee Police Department seized 8,076 guns from January 1st, 2020 to July 8th, 2022. Nearly half of those firearms came from several neighborhoods with north side zip codes. Given the adage, so goes Milwaukee, so goes the state, how would you curb the presence of illegal firearms in the state? Well, there's several things we have to do, but I'm going to go back to shared revenue because in order for those great people that work in, in, in the city of Milwaukee to do their work, they need the support financially from the state, whether it's issues about training or any other things that are going on in the, in the city of Wisconsin, the city of Madison. That said, shared revenue will be increased by this administration. In addition, I am somebody that actually believes that uh, uh, we, have some sh uh, we have some really thoughtful things that we can do around guns. And universal background checks are one, red flag laws are another. 
time and time again when the, when, uh, when the Marquette University poll uh, talked about this and asked the questions. 70, 80% of the people of Wisconsin said these are reasonable things we can do to provide safe, safe uh, safety in, in, the, in that arena. So let's do that. Let's bring, bring people together. Let's have this, uh, have this discussion and let's make some changes in Wisconsin. Mr. Michaels, your response about the abundance of guns. Yes, Ken, thank you for uh, the question about crime, uh, specifically in Milwaukee, but all across the state, crime is running rampant. And, and guns, I have a solution for that. But let's talk about crime in Milwaukee. I've spent a lot of time in the inner city in Milwaukee. Uh, people tell me, like, Tim, why are you spending time in the uh, near north side or the south side of Milwaukee? And I say, because I'm going to be a governor for all. Milwaukee is not the problem. Milwaukee has a problem, and I'm going to fix it. We're going to get crime down, and we're going to get education scores up to provide opportunity for the young men and women that have no option but to be on the streets. Guns are everywhere. I'll tell you, I was up in Wausau this week, and I spoke with officials at the Marathon County Sheriff's Department. They told me that three quarters, 75% of recent homicides were stabbings. Those weren't, those weren't gun violence. It was knife violence. The left always just wants to take away guns and thinks that's the problem. I'm a responsible gun owner. I will protect your Second Amendment rights. Thank you. There is a follow-up question from Dr. Ken. Mr. Michaels, in that same area, 19 states have red flag laws. Universal background check proposals did not make it out of legislative committee. What is your stance on the use of extreme risk protection orders and universal background checks? Yeah, I'd like to explain for people at home red flag laws. So here's, here's a hypothetical example. Uh, an ex could say, a disgruntled ex could say, my ex who's a hunter ha has some weapons at home and I'm afraid of that. And without due process, those guns could be confiscated. That's unconstitutional, first of all. And it's also a slippery slope. We need to make sure that we uphold the Constitution and that law-abiding gun owners are not having their guns confiscated. I will be there for responsible gun owners. We're going to have 600,000 deer hunters hit the woods in a few weeks. I'll be one of them. I love deer camp. But with the millions of guns in Wisconsin, we need to make sure that the responsible gun owners are not going to become subject to having their guns taken away without due process because they have rights and our Constitution here is at stake. Governor Evers, your response on red flag laws and universal background checks. Of course, I have supported both of those. Uh, they are reasonable things. Marquette University poll polls on this, this issue many, many times. It's always 70 to 80 percent of the, uh, the uh, you know, I have to say, res responsible gun owners don't have to worry about red flag laws because it'll never be an issue for them. What we want to do is make sure that people that are in danger or are, are making threats uh, or are uh, hurting, uh, thinking about hurting themselves. And it is, has due process. It has to go in front of a judge. We have to have law enforcement people go in front of a judge and make that request. That said, 70 to 80 percent of the people of Wisconsin support this. Of that, almost all the hunters have supported it also. So this is something we can do. Is it going to solve every problem? Of course it's not. There's no solution that's going to do that. But it seems reasonable. People of Wisconsin, Wisconsin want it. It is, a, you know, the will of the people is the law of the land. Governor, you mentioned red flag laws. What about background checks? I, I, I certainly believe that background checks should also be there. Universal background checks are just common sense, just common sense. All right, thank you. Now we go to our next questioner, which is Victor Jacobo from CBS 58 in Telemundo, Wisconsin. Governor Evers and Mr. Michaels, let's talk about this election process. Recounts, investigations, and audits into the 2020 election have found no evidence of widespread voter fraud. Despite that evidence, there are voters in Wisconsin tonight who still believe the 2020 election was rigged, and there are voters who fear that reaction to that by state officials will result in restrictions that will take away or discount their vote. What is your plan to rebuild voter confidence in the state's election process? Governor, you go first with a minute. Absolutely. And the last election was safe, secure, and there was not fraud. I mean, honest to gosh, there's one reason that people are concerned about it is we have people like my opponent that continue to talk about massive fraud without having any, any idea or any, any spe specifics. We 
our, it was it was safe, fair, and and we we can have confidence in in our election. You know, when when someone talks about issues are, are like this uh, around, they they don't know if they're going to certify the, the the present election. Certification is something the governor does. They do it in a very specific way. When my opponent says, well, I'm not sure if the legislature sends me something that says that, that uh, Biden lost and Trump won, I don't know if I'm going to sign that. Well, you have to. That's part of the process. Voting rights are on this ballot. It is radical to say, I'm not sure how this works out or that fraud happened when it didn't happen. Time is up. Governor, Mr. Michaels. Yes, Victor, thank you for the question. But to clarify, uh, you need to go a little bit further than your question. There is a nonpartisan legislative commission that did find that illegal voting did happen in the last election. They also found out that clerks were given illegal uh, guidance by the Wisconsin Elections Commission. Look, I I'm a candidate today. I wish all these election integrity issues were fixed in previous administrations, but they weren't. I will make sure that once I'm governor, we never have these questions again about election integrity. I will work with the legislature. We will get these bills right, the bills that Governor Evers vetoed, and we will make sure that people don't have any more questions about things like out-of-state billionaires coming in and taking over our election process, the Zuckerbucks. I'll make sure that the ballot harvesting stops. I'll make sure that we stop the indefinitely confined status. Under a Governor Michaels administration, we will never have questions, and of course, therefore, I will certify any elections after I'm elected governor. Thank you, and just a reminder that our data team is posting information about all of these topics that you can read more about, including fact checks on these issues. Let's go to our next questioner, and that is Frederica Freiburg of PBS Wisconsin. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, on the issue of abortion, please specify what your position is on access to abortion in Wisconsin following the reversal of Roe v. Wade, including whether you favor criminalizing abortion pills through the mail and people in Wisconsin crossing state lines to get an abortion in a state where it is legal. First to you, Mr. Michaels, one minute. Yes, Frederica, thank you, thank you for the question. I really look forward to the opportunity to clear a few things up here. Uh, you know, Governor Evers and the left have spent tens of millions of dollars uh, mischaracterizing my position, calling me a radical. I, I am pro-life and I make no apologies for that. But I'll tell you who the real radical is. The real radical is Governor Evers where he is for allowing abortion as late as at the time of birth. Even vetoed the Born Alive bill, which would allow a doctor to murder a baby after birth. That is extreme. That is radical. Now, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a common sense guy, and I've listened to the people, and I will always listen to the people. And I've said that if a bill is put before me from the legislature, which is a direct representation of the people, and it has an exception in it for rape and incest, that I would sign that bill. Uh, you know, this, this stuff about are you going to uh, prohibit uh, out of, uh, pills to come through the mail, if it's against the law, then that's against the law. And I'm not against contraception. Time is up, but the one other question was mail order pills, as you mentioned, and I'm also sure. crossing straight state lines for legal abortions elsewhere. You know, like I said, I'm, I'm a reasonable guy, and people say, Tim, you have a lot of common sense. So, you know, that's something that we'll have to sit down and work out, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be this radical guy with uh, spot checks at the border. Governor? Well, the bottom line here is, is this. Women should have the ability and the right to make decisions about their health care, including reproductive health care, and that includes abortion. My opponent is radical on this issue, and frankly, uh, uh, he's radical because it's, an, it's not consistent with Wisconsin values. We've had 50 years of Roe v. Wade, and it's worked here in the state of Wisconsin. We should go back there. But to think that we are in a position in this state of Wisconsin where we have a governor saying, we're going to criminalize abortion, we're going to throw doctors in jail, and we're not going to have any exceptions for rape or incest. Those positions taken by my opponent here are radical. They're not consistent with Wisconsin values. All right, we'll go to the next question, and that's Amy DuPont of WKBT La Crosse. Good evening. I'd like to talk about health care costs. 
According to the Wisconsin Hospitals Association, $1.1 billion in unpaid Badger Care patient costs are not covered by the state. So that $1.1 billion then is shifted onto all Wisconsin businesses and families. How would you reduce the reimbursement gap to lower health care costs for all Wisconsinites? Governor Evers, you have one minute. Yeah, health care is a huge issue for, for everybody in this country, and it can, will continue to be that way. I believe that one of the ways that we can make our health system the best it could be, we could join a whole bunch of other states. We're only 12 of us that haven't taken Medicaid expansion or Badger Care expansion. If we would take that opportunity from the federal government, and there's also, obviously with those numbers, there's all sorts of Republican governors that have gone along with this. We would be able to put good health care, good health insurance to 126,000 people in the state of Wisconsin that frankly don't have that good coverage. That, and then in addition to that, we would reap a, another billion dollars from the, from the federal government to take issues such as, and, and, and do and fix the issues around child and, and mater, uh, maternal and child wellness and a lot of other issues that we have in the state of Wisconsin. It's us for making that thank decision. Thank you, Governor. Your we time's need to up. do it. Mr. Michaels. Yes, thank you. And healthcare is a very important issue, and, and I know that. I mean, at Michaels Corporation, we provide platinum healthcare for all of our employees. We know that if you take care of people, good things will happen. And Badger Care, Badger Care and Family Care were started by Governor Tommy Thompson, who, who's endorsed me. He had great vision, and it helped millions of people over the last 20 plus years. So I'm gonna make sure that there are adequate dollars there for people so that they can receive the health care that is needed. If we have people that are healthy and have proper health care, they will be more productive members. They'll be able to get to work, help, ra help raise their family, be part of the community. We need to make sure that health care is there for all. I will make sure that the funding is available. And I'm not just a candidate or a politician talking about it. I've done it, and I'm going to do it as governor. All right, let's go to the next question, Victor Jacobo. Let's move on to the topic of conflicts of interest. This is what Wisconsin state statute says. No state public official may use their public position to obtain financial gain or anything of substantial value for the private benefit of themselves or their immediate family. Governor Evers, you are expected to adhere to that during your term in office. Mr. Michaels, your construction company has done more than a billion dollars in business with state and contracts. Governor Evers, have you adhered to that law and how? And Mr. Michaels, how will you adhere to that law if elected governor? Mr. Michaels, you have one minute. Yes, great question, and, and thank you for allowing me to clear this up a little bit. So every single bid that Michaels has won, we were the low bidder in a transparent bidding process. If you go back over the past few years, we've saved the state tens of millions of dollars and provided a very high quality product. Now, the day after election day, between then and inauguration day, I'm gonna completely divest from Michaels Corporation. There will be no conflict of interest. Look, I'm a man of highest integrity. I was 12 years in the Army on active duty, attaining the rank of major. I was hand selected to be the commander of the honor guard at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. And our business that we helped grow, my brothers and I, from a few hundred to over 8,000 a day, that doesn't happen without having integrity and providing firm leadership. I will do the right thing here, and the people of Wisconsin have no concerns. Thank you. Governor? Well, certainly I have, uh, I've met all the, all the legal uh, parameters that, that are po posted on uh, for, for the governor of the state of Wisconsin. There are, but I'm, a, I'm a guy from Plymouth who was a teacher, for God's sakes. There's not many, there's not many things that uh, are r really problematic about this. Now, I understand that uh, there's that uh, my opponent's going to be divesting and all that, but there there, there is, and I'm sure they're going to continue to uh, uh, seek bids from the state of Wisconsin. How do we? How do, and I and I'm I'm not impending, impending his uh, uh, his honesty here, but how do we actually know? How that's going to work? Do, do we need to change the process so that uh, uh, that it isn't a problem? I've read that it is a problem by some people, but uh, I'm not an expert in this. But I I think it's going to look kind of fishy. Let's go to our next questioner, and that is Michelle McCormick. 
According to the Wisconsin Department of Revenue, our state has a projected budget surplus of an estimated $5 billion. As governor, what will you do with the money? Governor Evers, you have a minute. Well, thank you so much for that question. And, and frankly, one of the reasons uh, that, that, uh, that amount of money is in our, uh, in our rainy day fund and in, in, our, in, in our surplus, it is because we did the right thing during the pandemic. We made sure that uh, uh, when we looked at the revenue coming in during the pandemic, that people that worked in small businesses were suffering, that people that are farmers were suffering, the, uh, our, our tourism industry and, and restaurants. So we took you know, about a billion dollars of, of the money that we received from the federal government from both the Trump administration and the, uh, and the administration, uh, that, the Biden administration. And we invested in that. We, we had a, a good outcome in, in that uh, we've got the lowest unemployment ever and the highest number of people working ever. Our economy is strong. We need to use this to, as I said before, 10% tax cut, get rid of the, the, uh, uh, the minimum markup law, and provide tax credits. Thank you, Governor. Mr. Michaels. Yes, thank you for that question. So $5.8 billion surplus, that's with the rainy day fund. But the, the Barnes and Evers, sorry, Evers Barnes administration thinks that that's a good thing. I think that's an awful thing. Why? Because that's your tax dollars. The people of Wisconsin were overtaxed by nearly $6 billion. We are gonna do massive tax reform. I'm gonna put that money back into the hardworking people's pockets. What will that do? That will stimulate our economy. I'm telling you right now, this excess in taxes that some people think is a good thing is wrong. There's a lot of needs out there, but there's a $43.5 billion annual state budget right now. We just need to have businessmen that are in there and can do a proper analysis. We have 16 operating divisions at Michaels Corporation. We do a deep dive monthly, and we do a formal review quarterly. I know how to analyze. I know how to make government more efficient. Right now, you're paying too much, too much in taxes, but I'm here to tell you, help is on the way. Next question goes to Dan Hagen. Climate change is already affecting Wisconsinites. I have reported on Ojibwe people in northern Wisconsin and their reliance on wild rice. But more frequent extreme weather events tied to climate change are disrupting wild rice beds, threatening a source of food and culture for the Ojibwe. How should Wisconsin respond to a changing climate? Mr. Michaels, you have one minute. Yeah, thank you, thank you for that question. So I, I have to admit I was unaware of the uh, wild rice problem, but you're tying it to, uh, to, to, to climate change. Look, I want a clean planet for my children, my future grandchildren. I want clean drinking water. I want, I want to have, make sure that everyone does the right thing. And at Michaels Corporation, we're a very responsible operator. We're an environmental leader. We have a Green, two, green Tier 2 award from the DNR for all of our great environmental in, initiatives. So climate change, uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion about that. Has, has the temperature gone up? Temperature has always fluctuated throughout the history of this world. And we can't just say that it all happened because of man's actions in the last 100 years. But we should be all be responsible, like we are at Michaels Corporation, and do everything we can to make sure we have a healthy planet for future generations. Mr. Michaels, I think the question was, what would you do for Wisconsin specifically? Uh, I'm going to provide the leadership. As governor, I'm going to be a bold leader, and I'm going to make sure that we do all of the right things. I'm going to make sure that we uh, work with the DNR. And by the way, the DNR has a lot of problems. Uh, it's, it's probably close to being broken. I'm going to fix that. I know how to fix that. Uh, and we're going to make sure that the people of Wisconsin know that they're being taken care of and that we are going to take care of the environment. Governor? Well, instead of blah, blah here, I'm going to talk about our clean energy plan. It is something that's really working well in the state of Wisconsin. We've actually been able to uh, increase solar in the state of Wisconsin, and, uh, and it's, it's not because people are not are, are, are for clean energy necessarily. They just know it's the right thing to do, and it's cheaper. So we're gonna continue our efforts around solar, and we're gonna continue our efforts around mitigating climate change. I, I think I heard that he doesn't believe in climate change. I, I do believe in climate change. It's making a difference. We're working with the Ojibwe on that issue as we speak with that DNR that apparently is so dysfunctional. That said, we are gonna to continue to make sure 
that the clean energy plan is, is in place. And I'm so pleased actually with uh, the farmers of the state. They're working together on uh, making sure that their practices are good. Farmer-led watershed uh, groups all across the state are keeping Thank our, you, Governor. Our... Your time is up. Sorry. Let's now move on to Amy DuPont. Wisconsin has a water problem. Thousands of Milwaukee homes still get their water through lead laterals. Hundreds of utilities statewide exceed safe nitrate levels. And in La Crosse and Marinette counties, thousands of families have been drinking bottled water for years because the water coming from their faucet is contaminated with PFAS. Now the state dollars currently set aside to address these issues won't be enough to help everyone who needs help. How would you prioritize spending the limited dollars that Wisconsin has to provide safe water for the most Wisconsinites? Governor Evers, you have one minute. Okay, we have been working on this problem for four years I've been in, in office. It is, an it is an immense problem, and we're making progress in the Milwaukee area and across the state around lead laterals. The good news is the recently passed bill in the federal government is bringing, bringing uh, funding in exactly for that. But I have to talk about the issue of PFAS and, and other things. I heard my opponent uh, slam the DNR just for a few minutes there. The reason we can't get, on, get going on that is because of one member on the DNR board who was appointed by my predecessor and he won't leave and the Senate won't, uh, won't uh, approve my well-qualified uh, uh, candidate. That's crazy. You know, we, it's going to take us another three years to set standards because one person has decided not to leave the DNR board. That's the dysfunction. Mr. Michaels? Yes, Amy, thank you. That, that's a great question. And I, I want to say that I am a business leader who understands this problem. I talked about the 8,000 employees that we have at Michaels Corporation. We're, we're an infrastructure contractor. I understand something about putting pipe in the ground, replacing pipe. I know that we've put in over 4,000 megawatts of renewable energy. And I know that we stand by what we do. With this PFOS issue, it means there were some bad actors out there that did the wrong thing. Businesses will be held accountable. I'm not going to let them get off the hook. When they try and leave the state or declare bankruptcy, I'm going to make sure that there is remedies there because having clean drinking water is one of the primary roles of government. We need to ensure that happens. But if there are no monies left, if, all, if everybody's gone bankrupt and is gone, then of course the state should and will step in and make sure that the people of Wisconsin have clean drinking water. And once again, a reminder that complex issues like this are worth reading more about and our data team is providing additional information on the WBA debate website. Let's go to our next questioner and that is Frederica Freiberg. Thank you. On education, Tim Michaels says that he is in favor of universal school choice, which would open up private school attendance to any student at taxpayer expense. Tony Evers wants to put $2 billion into public school funding. The question is, why should or shouldn't Wisconsin fund two parallel school systems, one private and one public? This question goes first to Mr. Michaels. Yes, Frederica, thank you. thank you for the question. And the, the quick answer is because every parent is a taxpayer. So they should all equally have the benefit of those tax dollars to educate their kids. Our education system is broken in Wisconsin. What do I mean by that? The test scores continue to go down. The state tests, the forward tests, bad numbers, getting worse. The national tests, the NAEP tests, the numbers continue to go down. Tony Evers, He's been in charge of education his whole life. Uh, he's been a head of education here in Wisconsin for the past 13, 14 years. You would think that education would be going well under his leadership, but it's not. Something has to change. Why? Because we have nine schools in Wisconsin where the reading comprehension score is zero. 60% of the kids in our schools cannot read at the grade level. I am going to do universal school choice. It can't get any worse. It will get better because we're going to empower parents those tuition dollars are going to go with the, parent, or the sons and daughters of those parents, and we are going to stop the CRT and get back to the ABCs. Time is up, please. Governor? CRTs are not taught in our schools, and the ABCs are. In fact, most parents teach the ABCs at home and, uh, with third graders. Here's the deal. We have 99 uh, uh, issues, on, uh, referendum issues on, on this next election. 
from 60 some school districts in the state. They are saying we don't have enough money. In fact, if you think about how much money uh, is different here, in, in the state of Connecticut, it, take, it costs $47,000 a year tuition. In the state of Wisconsin, Milwaukee Public Schools has $16,000. There's a big difference there. There, we do need more resources. We need to make sure that we have more special education money. We need to make sure that we have mental health money. We need to make sure that our literacy program is, is making the top readers in the state. All these things can be done. Yes, I'm gonna increase the budget, but frankly, the idea that my opponent Time is up, Governor, sorry. But we do have a follow-up question from Frederica. This just came up, um, but Tim Michaels, um, you often say that we need to stop the CRT and get back to the ABCs. The Department of Public Instruction says critical race theory, the university level academic theory, is not being taught in Wisconsin K-12 classrooms. What is your position on how the history of race should be taught in our schools? And this goes first to Governor Evers for one minute. First of all, I have to tell you that one of the things that concerns me the most, and it is a radical position, when you, when you say, should we fund our schools more? It was defined as, that's the definition of insanity by my opponent. In addition, he, what his plan right now is to take 40% of the funding away from our public schools. That is called defunding our public schools. That's a, both of those are radical, radical positions. They are not what the people of Wisconsin. I've run for office several times now in the state of Wisconsin. Republican moms and dads and Democratic moms and dads want great schools. And that is what we're gonna get. We need to make sure that we have the resources to do this. As far as CRT, it is not taught in our, in our schools. I said that before, and it's maybe taught, maybe had discussions at the uh, uh, at the university level. This is it's a rouge, frankly. Governor, let me let me follow up more specifically because yeah. the question then is how should the history of race in our country be taught in our schools? Well, can, it absolutely can be. It, it has nothing to do with uh, CRT. You know, should we talk about the fact that? Uh, at some grade level that the Japanese were interned during World War II, Japanese Americans were interned. Of course we want to talk about that. We, we shouldn't be afraid of that. We are a strong state and a strong country. If we can't talk about things like that, we're in sad shape. We must have, you know, obviously parents have a role in making those decisions and teachers. We've always been able to figure this Thank out. Thank you, Governor. Mr. Yes, Frederica, th thank you for that question, and there, we could talk all night about education, and I, I'd love to. As I said earlier, I'm going to spend more money on education than any governor in the history of this state because education is so important to educating our, and training our future leaders uh, of this state, future leaders of, of TV stations and restaurants and construction companies and nonprofits. Right now, they are being failed. How are we going to teach race? We're going to get parents involved. Right now, parents show up to a school board meeting, and they're given the stiff arm. We know what we're doing. Let us educrats educate your kids best. Parents are screaming right now, and I disagree with the statement, Frederica, that, that uh, you know everything is being taught properly right now. Parents have come to me, and they've shown me the stuff that is being taught to their kids in school, and they're outraged, and they don't like it. I'm going to empower parents by having those tuition dollars go with their sons and daughters to the school of their choice, those tuition dollars that they paid taxes on, we are going to make education better for everyone here in the state of Wisconsin. Mr. Michaels, more specifically, you s the question was how should the history of race be taught in schools? Yeah, I, I, I answered it. I said we're going to get parents involved and we're going to let parents decide. Not a couple of woke educrats that are going to say this is what it is now, we're going to start teaching this, that, that this is bad and this is good. We're going to figure this out, we're going to do what's right so we don't confuse and cloud the judgment of our future leaders of Wisconsin. Our next question goes to uh, Michelle McCormick. We hear a lot of talk about crime fighting in Wisconsin. What is your detailed plan for crime prevention? Mr. Michaels, you have a minute. Oh, thank you very much for this question. Cr crime is running rampant. You know, crime went down in America from 30 years ago until two years ago. But in the last two years, there's been a tremendous spike. I believe 
It is a byproduct of the defund the police movement. We got to this crazy spot in America where uh, less cops is better or, or police are bad. I don't buy that at all. I have the endorsement of multiple police associations. They know that the Governor Evers administration has provided weak leadership. They told me directly. They don't feel like he has their back. I'm going to stand with law enforcement. Why? Because the hardworking, taxpaying, law-abiding citizens are really fearful of the surge in crime that we've had in Wisconsin over the last two years. I'm going to talk to the bad guys, if you will, on election night in my victory speech. And I'm going to talk to them on in my inaugural speech. I'm going to let them know that there's a new sheriff in town and they're beholden right now. But they're going to understand that if they're not willing to do the time, they shouldn't do the crime. Governor? Well, absolutely. People should have the opportunity to uh, be safe in their neighborhoods and safe in their homes. Who wouldn't believe that? Absolutely that we have to have that. But in order to accomplish that, it isn't just about talking tough, believe me. It is about providing the resources so that those police officers can do the job, the training that needs that maybe needs to be happened. And that and we put over a million dollars, in, or excuse me, a hundred million dollars during the pandemic for the Milwaukee area and other places across the state of Wisconsin for violence prevention, for local, local officers and, and police officers and EMTs. We have to make that happen in a consistent way. And the only way we're going to do it, we're going to go back and talk about this again, is, is, is revenue sharing. Shared revenue is such an important thing. If we want our municipalities to do the hard work, they deserve to have the money. I'm going to have 12% in this next budget for them. Let's go to our next question from Amy DuPont. I would like to ask you about parole. So Wisconsin abolished parole about 20 years ago, which means only people convicted before the year 2000 are eligible. According to the state, that's roughly about 1,700 people. It is up to the Wisconsin Parole Commission to grant discretionary parole. The governor appoints the commission's chairperson. What factors as governor do you want that chairperson to consider when deciding whether eligible individuals should be released? Governor Evers, you have one minute. Absolutely, and I'm glad you pointed out that uh, uh, the governor does not control the, the, the parole board. They make those decisions. It's against the law for the governor to to uh, issue paroles. Um, that said, the, um, the most important thing, and I, and I just recently fired the head of the commission for this very reason, he did not take victim rights in, into, a, uh, into account for uh, one particular case. So I asked him to reverse that, he did. I asked him to resign, he did. It was a wrong decision. So do we need to strengthen that? Absolutely. But at the end of the day, I'm gonna sound, it's, it's gonna be a, a record again. This is about shared revenue. You know, we can talk about parole, but we also have all sorts of issues in the criminal justice system that need to be addressed. And it's mostly done at the state level. I have tried to get a, a shared revenue increase. We're gonna make it done, uh, make it happen this time around. Shared revenue is what our, our, our folks at the local level are asking for. Thank you, Governor. Mr. Michaels. Yes, Amy, uh, thank you for the question. I, I really wanna tie that into the last two questions. Uh, the one about crime, and you heard more money, more resources, more resources, and it doesn't matter uh, about leadership. You know, you just talk tough. I am gonna be tough. And I am going to talk tough. And I am going to lead the men and women of law enforcement. That's how you get crime down in Wisconsin. And on the issue of parole, the same thing. Right now, Governor Evers, the Evers-Barnes administration, made a pledge four years ago during their campaign to cut in half the prison population. They released over 1,000 convicted felons. They have tens of, th about 10,000 more to go if you do the simple math on 21,000 people being incarcerated in Wisconsin. And of those, about 300 are convicted murderers, attempted murderers, 44 are child rapists. I will pick a, a, a chief parole commissioner who is going to make sure that we have rule of law in Wisconsin and l lets the bad guys know that they're not going to get out if they're not willing, if they're not willing Thank to you. stick to the, doing Let's the Let's go to Dr. Harris. Mr. Michaels, if elected, what will your administration do to ensure the safety of Wisconsinites during civil unrest? while securing their First Amendment right to assemble. You have one minute. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Harris. Uh, gr great, great question. So we saw the civil unrest 
if you will. I think it was a uh, mob mentality that hit Kenosha two years ago. Um, hundreds of businesses were burned. And I met with local law enforcement people down there, county leaders. And you know what they told me? We were all doing everything that we could. Uh, we were doing our part. The feds were doing their part. The fire department was there doing their part. The county was doing their part. But there was no leadership. It takes 90 minutes, 90 minutes to get from Madison to Kenosha. I would have been there in 90 minutes or less providing the leadership, making sure that our fourth largest city in Wisconsin didn't burn to the ground, that civil unrest didn't happen. And we call it civil unrest, or I believe Governor Evers called it uh, uh, civil disruption the other day at the Rotary Club. You know what? There's a big difference between peaceful protests and what we saw all happen on TV in Kenosha. It won't happen under Governor Michael's administration. Governor Evers? A lot to talk about here. In Kenosha, I did every single thing that was asked of me. In addition, right from the get-go, the day the, the, the first uh, shot was fired, we had people coming in, we had uh, state troopers coming in. I control state troopers, troopers. We had them coming into Kenosha. We, brought, we worked with lo local municipalities around Kenosha to get them on, on board, and they came uh, very well. And at 2 o'clock in the morning, people need to know this, the, uh, the, our National Guard is only allowed to move if we are requested. And Kenosha asked us at 2 o'clock in the morning, that same day after 2 o'clock in the morning, we had people on, on, we had National Guard there, and we doubled it every single day. If you want to know the truth about this situation, instead of listening to my opponent, just ask the Kenosha County Sheriff, who is a Republican. He said we did Thank everything you, we needed to do. Let's go to Frederick Freiburg. This question is on the worker shortage. Uh, Wisconsin already has a teacher shortage, and a new report shows that by 2030, the state will see a decline of 130,000 workers, with young people in Wisconsin leaving and not being replaced by people moving here. What is your prescription for attracting and retaining young adults to our workforce? This question goes first to Governor Evers for a minute. Yeah, absolutely. Worker shortage is an issue in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, we, you know, just population-wise, most people are my age, and uh, when when you get down into our kindergarten area, uh, it's a lot less people. So we have to plan ahead, obviously. But one of the things we we need to do is make sure that we have some civil discussions across the state of Wisconsin. Politics are difficult here; they're difficult all across our all across our country. I'm committed to do that. But that said. I will also say that we spent uh, a fair amount of money, I think it's about $100 million, $100 million during the pandemic, allowing local people to think through what they should be doing locally in order to, uh, uh, in order to make sure that uh, they, have, uh, they don't have a worker shortage. They come up with great ideas. Some of them actually, you know, about upskilling people to make sure they have the skills for advan advanced manufacturing. Other people are, are going to be putting affordable housing up, making child care more available. Thank Those you, are Governor. the things that we need to do. Mr. Michaels? Yes, uh, th thank you, Frederica. Great question. So everywhere I go across Wisconsin, from Kenosha to Superior, from La Crosse to Sheboygan, Fond du Lac, Wausau, everywhere in between, I hear about the help wanted signs that are out. We need more workers. Farmers are telling me about it. Manufacturing companies are telling me about it. I have two solutions. Number one, we're gonna get people off of their couches and get them back to work. We created an entire class of lazy people during COVID. And it's time to get them back engaged in our economy to stop just sending them the unemployment checks, the COVID subsidy checks, which I know are now gone, but they were getting them and that's how they got lazy. The second thing we're gonna do with this tax reform that I talked about earlier, we're gonna make Wisconsin a much more attractive place to live. People, young students that are getting out of college, they're gonna to wanna to stay here. Military members that are getting out of the service, they'll want to come back to Wisconsin or relocate to Wisconsin because it's such a, great, such a great state to raise a family in and we have a great work ethic here. Time is up and let's go now to Victor Jacobo. There are approximately 75,000 undocumented immigrants living in Wisconsin, as well as about 7,000 recipients of the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, often referred to as DACA. Would you support driver's licenses and in-state tuition for undocumented immigrants and DACA recipients? Why or why not? Mr. Michaels, you have one minute. 
Yes, thank you for that question, Victor. So uh, the first thing that we need to do is we need to make sure that our border is secure. No sovereign nation can be sovereign if we have this leaky border that we have. There's been three million illegal immigrants that have come into this country in the 20 months of the Joe Biden administration. That should stop. Now, I'm all for more immigrants in Wisconsin. We need more. I just talked about uh, help wanted signs everywhere, but we need to get them in here legally. This is a federal issue. We should expand the federal immigration plan so that the people that want to come to America and pursue their American dream have their opportunity. And then America has the opportunity to make sure that bad guys aren't coming across the border because they seek an opportunity here to have more crime. Uh, like, like we're seeing with a lot of the gangs that are out there. So, yeah, I want to make sure that we have uh, uh, more workers, but we cannot reward beha bad behavior and no driver's license for illegals. Governor? I'm still trying to battle the issue of lazy Wisconsinites when we have so few people that are unemployed in the state of Wisconsin. But that's it. Let's go to the next question. I think this is a very critical question, and it shows the differences between the two people here. Yes, we have 70,000 people, undocumented people in the state of Wisconsin. Whether they're, most of them are working hard, whether it's in our, whether they're in our factories, whether they're in in, uh, uh, in an agriculture area. If we if we don't do something, well, I mean, if if those people would leave the agriculture industry, we would no longer be the dairy state folks. We depend on that labor, and they provide great labor. We need to be able to say to them, yeah, you should be able to have a driver's license. You should be able to do it. It'll be safer because they'll have to take, take a test. In addition, DACA, DACA kids should be able to get in-state tuition. That's the least we can do for all the work these people are doing Thank you, for Governor. Us. We have another question, and this is a 30-second question, and Victor has that. Candidates, if you lose in November and following the normal processes of county canvases and potential recounts, do you commit to respect the outcome of this gubernatorial election and acknowledge it as fair and final? Uh, governor, you go first. Thank you. And uh, yes, absolutely. That's my job as governor. I certified the election last time. The information came in from all those hardworking people in, the, in at the local districts uh, across the state that, uh, frankly, we, we owe them our thanks. Yes, I did it last time. Yes, no matter who wins, my opponent or me, I will certify that election. Absolutely. Mr. Michaels? Yes, of course I will certify the next election. And there's all these radical conspiracy theories about Republicans and they won't certify election. I spent 12 years on active duty. I took that oath of office. I swore up under up to uphold and defend the Constitution, of course I'm going to certify the next election. But what I want to make sure after I'm governor that we're not having these conversations two years from now, four years from now, and beyond. I'm going to fix the election process and make sure that no one in Wisconsin, no Republican, Independent, nor Democrat, ever has another question about election integrity. Thank you. We have time for one final question, and because you've been so efficient, you'll actually get 90 seconds for this wow, one. Let's go that? to our last question. It's our cleanup question, Dan. During this debate, or in ads, you have heard things said about you that you believe are just plain wrong. In this last question, we want to give you a chance to set the record straight. What has been said about you that you really want to knock down? Our first Question and response goes to Mr. Michaels. Yeah, Dan, th th thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, they, the other side, they spent tens of millions of dollars trying to characterize me as as radical and irresponsible. Anything, but that's anything but the truth. So, you know, one of them is that uh, we have a bad culture at Michaels Corporation. Let me give you some numbers. The first number is there's been five sexual allegations over the 62-year history of our company, and zero of them have been found to be true. We have a tremendous culture at Michaels, a tremendous culture of respect, respect for women, respect for minorities, respect for everybody. Ask anyone that works at Michaels. We have you know, 8,000 employees with spouses, with nieces and nephews. You can find somebody. They will tell you what a tremendous culture that we have. You know, here we are trying to throw one of Wisconsin's greatest businesses under the bus for political gain. 
That's one of the big differences in this election cycle. It's are we going to elect people that have done real things in life, people that have, that have made payroll, that have made tough decisions, that have actually created jobs, not just talk about creating jobs, but done it. I've created thousands of jobs, thousands of non-union jobs, thousands of union jobs, and I know how to get things done. The Governor Evers administration, all he wants to do is blame others and talk about more resources, more money. It's not my fault. It's the legislature's fault. It's the parole commissioner's fault. I'm a leader that will take responsibility. I'm a man of integrity, and we will have a better Wisconsin for generations to come. Governor Evers, this is your chance to set the record straight and clean the record for you. Absolutely. They keep saying that I, that I, I sleep too late. I get up early just like any other human being that's working hard to, wo to work for the people of Wisconsin. So going to, going to bed late, getting up early, they say that I spend too much sleeping. I'm just kidding, frankly, <laughs> but it is a bunch of crap. Uh, here's the deal. Our economy in the state of Wisconsin is strong. We are strong because we're Wisconsinites. We've been able to fix the roads. We've been able to um, provide resources for our public schools. We've cut taxes by 15%, and we've brought businesses to every corner of the state of Wisconsin, small businesses, over 6,000 right now, heading to 7,000. So we've been successful. We've been doing the right thing, and we're going to continue doing the right thing going forward. We're strong. We're a strong state, and we're going to continue to be strong. Here's my beef. This November, we're going to be making a huge choice here in the state of Wisconsin. It's about continuing to do the right thing, making, being a strong Wisconsin, or frankly, going backwards because we have, we've chosen a, a, a governor who, you know, on issues after issue after issue, on abortion, on voting rights, on education, radical solutions that are going to hurt our state. Folks, First of all, thanks to the, the group of the broadcasters for doing this great work tonight. And thank you. I hope to have your vote this, this, this November. Thank you, Governor Evers. Thank you, Mr. Michael. Michaels, and I'd also like to thank our question team, and I'm going to name them again for you. It's Amy DuPont from La Crosse, Frederica Freiberg from here in Madison, Dan Hagen from Rhinelander, Dr. Ken Harris from Milwaukee, Victor Jacobo from Milwaukee and Telemundo, Wisconsin, the statewide, and Michelle McCormick from Green Bay. We've covered the state. We'd also like to thank our data team members who have been working behind the scenes and really want to tell you that these research materials can be found at WBA's debate website and social media accounts with the hashtag WBA debate. Thanks to Jonathan Krause from Appleton, James Langer from Madison, and Juliana Tornabini from Madison. And now, Michelle Vetterkind. Thank you for joining us for tonight's debate, an opportunity for Wisconsin citizens to hear from the leading gubernatorial candidates. This debate has been sponsored by our WBA Foundation through a grant from the Wisconsin Association of Independent Colleges and Universities and the Wisconsin Counties Association. Our sincere thanks to the Wisconsin radio and TV stations who work together to produce and air this broadcast. To the candidates, our moderator, our analysts, our data team. As always, WBA member stations will be on duty to bring you the results. Election day is Tuesday, November 8th. Exercise your right as an American and vote.